Welcome to this week's episode of Brainstorm, where we give you a glimpse into the world of science for this Wednesday, October 24th, 2012. We begin with a story from the world of neuroscience. A group at UC San Francisco have conducted experiments involving the transplantation of embryonic neurons. These were simply proof-of-principle mouse model experiments, but some important discoveries were made. A specific type of neuron was used called GABA-secreting interneurons, important for generating inhibiting signals and maintaining a balance of activity in the brain. These neurons are of particular interest because they've been linked in some way to many diseases such as epilepsy, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, and Parkinson's. They may be dying for some reason or otherwise malfunctioning. Either way, renewing these brain cells could have multiple therapeutic effects. Other work has shown that transplants of these cells could create new periods of brain plasticity. So a major question was, how many embryonic neurons would survive after a transplant? What surprised the scientists in the mice was, no matter how many cells were transplanted, a consistent percentage lived. The current model for neuron development suggests that the survival and integration of neurons is dependent on signals from other cells. So they expected a small but finite amount to survive, no matter the initial amount. However, these experimental results suggest that the neurons may somehow support their own growth, which would explain the consistent survival percentage. Because the results were surprising, these experiments have larger implications for models of neural circuitry formation. Although it's also a very encouraging discovery from a therapeutic perspective, suggesting substantial number of these important neurons may survive transplantation, and encouraging further regenerative medicine research as it applies to the brain. Next is an update from the field of chemistry, particularly as it applies to abiogenesis. Although not as well supported as evolution yet, increasing research is revealing how life may have originally formed on Earth. For example, experiments done by Penn State researchers have modeled an essential step in the formation of life. DNA is the primary genetic model for life on Earth, but it's more complex than RNA, which likely formed chemically first. RNA can also take multiple forms and functions, such as storing genetic information or catalyzing reactions like an enzyme. A crucial step in the formation of RNA molecules would be compartmentalization, concentrating the building blocks in small localized areas. To mimic what this might have looked like in pre-life Earth, the researchers mixed an aqueous solution containing two different polymers and some RNA. Separation of these polymers created tiny compartments around the size of a modern cell. Although the polymers used in the experiment weren't likely around, it's a model for a relatively simple system providing a mechanism for compartmentalization before the formation of lipids, the molecules that make up modern cell membranes. As expected, the two polymer phase separation allowed the RNA to concentrate, resulting in more physical interaction. Another interesting discovery was that longer chains of RNA were favorably concentrated in the polymer compartments, further adding to our insight into abiogenesis, suggesting a system like this had a simplified form of natural selection. Our final story comes from the world of genetics. Researchers at the University of Illinois and Wisconsin have made some interesting discoveries in soybean genetics. You see, there's a particular pest called soybean cyst nematodes, and they cause hundreds of millions of dollars in damage annually. Some plant strains are naturally resistant to the nematodes, and these researchers wanted to find out why. A particular region of the soybean genome called RHG1 was associated with this trait but the exact genetic sequence wasn't known. Mapping of a narrow region narrowed it down to a few candidate genes. Then separately, the entire soybean genome was sequenced. This gave the researchers new insights, but there was an issue. The soybean that was fully sequenced wasn't a nematode-resistant variety. Even though they had the sequence for the RHG1 region, they knew it would be missing the gene they were looking for. So, they resequenced that segment from a resistant variety to compare and made some surprising discoveries. The resistant soybean didn't have any additional genes, missing genes, or even mutated genes, just extra copies. Soybean plants vulnerable to the nematodes have a single copy of four genes in close proximity, whereas resistant varieties have between three and ten copies. In the experiments, boosting any one of the four genes didn't produce resistance. At least three needed to have multiple copies in the genome. 
From a research perspective, it's a somewhat unique mechanism to regulate gene expression. And from a practical perspective, this discovery is very useful. Adding additional copies of these genes could be a relatively simple way to engineer the crop, creating soybean varieties that are highly resistant to these destructive and costly nematodes. Well, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please consider subscribing and be sure to check the links in the video description.